My heart in this whole ministry is talking about the relevance of the issue, why it matters, why it's important. And it really comes down to the fact that we're talking about biblical authority. Biblical authority in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we, we get misquoted out there all the time. Over and over again, we have people say that these people in Answers and Genesis, they say that believing in six literal days in young earth is a prerequisite to salvation. What nonsense. What nonsense. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But I guess it's because we speak so authoritatively about the things that we believe. I mean, we, we grow up in a world where not just in the secular world, but even in the Christian world, it's politically incorrect to come across in a, in a dogmatic way about a particular position. You know, you've got to allow all views. Well, how about that all those views are wrong and this is the right view? No, you can't have that, that view. You're to, intolerant of our view. Well, you're being intolerant of our view. But you're not allowing all views. Wait a minute. But you're not allowing all views. You're not allowing my view that says your view is wrong. <laughs> But see, when you speak authoritatively, then people automatically, I've just found in the Christian world with Christian leaders and in the secular world, as soon as you speak authoritatively about believing in Genesis, they, they immediately say, all you people say, you've got to believe that or you can't be a Christian. I, I wanted you to understand our heart and I put it together in a slightly different way than I normally do. We, I said I was going to go through Genesis 1.1 to Genesis 1.5. You know, this whole ministry is really built on the message of what I call the relevance of Genesis. That's what God has blessed, is that ministry, the importance of Genesis to all our doctrine, foundational to the gospel. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We want to go on from there. Genesis 1.2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. I want to go through now Genesis 1-2 to Genesis 1-5 with a particular emphasis. I like the way uh, the NIV actually puts it. Stop trusting in man. And that's exactly what Isaiah 2.22 says. And then Proverbs 30, 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. Do not add to his words. So let's start going through Genesis 1, 2 to Genesis 1, 5. But I'm going to start at Genesis 1, 1 again because, it, because there's a special topic we need to discuss in relation to the first two verses of Genesis 1. And it really relates to this whole, this whole thrust, this topic of stop trusting in man and I want you to see our heart coming through. I want you to see my burden coming through here as to why we do what we do. Why do we have such a burden to do what we do? Because people, there's a generational loss of biblical authority that's occurring in our culture. And you know why the older generation don't tend to understand it? And this is what I find. Many of the older generation, they believed in millions of years or even evolution, whatever, and they know they're saved and so on. And they say, you know, it, it didn't affect us. But what it did affect is how the next generation you influence view scripture itself. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. When I first started in the creation apologetics ministry, when I go around and speak, one of the views that was brought up time and time again was what is called the gap theory. And particularly a lot of the older generation pastors, I mean even Spurgeon entertained the gap theory. A lot of the older generation pastors taught the gap theory because for them it solved the issue of millions of years. See the idea of millions of years was popularized in the late 1700s, early 1800s. In fact as far as we know, the first person to really preach what we'll call the modern gap theory uh, in, in regard to you know, the idea of a ruined reconstruction Theory. You've heard of this idea, there's an original creation, it was a perfect creation, Lucifer ruled, then God judged with a, Lucifer rebelled, so God judged with a flood called Lucifer's flood, and that's where your fossils and your dinosaurs and your millions of years fit, and then God recreated everything in six days. Who's heard of something like that? There's various versions of it, but yeah, that's sort of the classic ruin reconstruction idea. Well, as far as we know, the man that really came up with that and popularized it was a man called Thomas Chalmers, who's the founder of the Free Church of Scotland. And... It, it, it appears that he first gave these back in lectures in 1814. He never wrote it down, but in verbal lectures he gave the gap theory. The main book that popularized the gap theory was a book called Earth's Earliest Ages. 
uh, and Earth's Earliest Ages by G. H. Pember. A lot of the older generation pastors, you know, people like Barnhouse and others, you think of a lot of the older generation pastors, they had Earth's Earliest Ages in their library. Certainly influenced a lot of people. It's interesting, I've noticed, I've noticed you know, over the years, now things have changed somewhat, but in the past, one of the things that I, I, I noticed was this. There were certain types of denominations that really, uh, they proposed, you know, they taught the idea of theistic evolution, God used evolution. Then there are others, they didn't want to believe in evolution, so they taught the gap theory. You tended to find the gap theory very prevalent in brethren churches, uh, oftentimes in Assembly of God churches, whereas you found theistic evolution more prevalent in Baptist churches and Presbyterian churches. It's interesting to see, you know, some of those things over the years. But this was first published in 1884, and there are a number of different editions of this and different publishers of this book, Earth's Earlier Stages. It's probably the book that really publicized the gap theory uh, in our modern era of history. Now, another man that had a great effect on the gap theory is a man called Arthur Custance. Arthur Custance wrote door, what are called a series of papers called the Doorway Papers. They're eventually uh, published in a series of volumes, hardcover volumes by Zondervan Publishing. And there were six papers in all. He wrote these between 1910 and 1985. He was an anthropologist. You know, he's a Christian, uh, but he believed in the gap theory. And we'll come back to some of the things that he said a little later on. But probably Arthur Custance, his book Without Form and Void, and Earth's Earliest Ages were the two books that really took the gap theory to prominence. And you see consequences of the gap theory. For instance, Schofield. In the Schofield Reference Bible, as you start to read it, you know, I'm always reminded, my father used to teach something that uh, I've never forgotten. He said, when you have a study Bible and you see the notes, always remember this, the notes are not inspired like the text, and the text should always be the commentary on the notes. <laughs> I've always remembered that. <laughs> but in the Schofield Reference Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Oh, and there's another verse in there. The earth was waste and empty by judgment, Jeremiah 4. That's not in my Bible. But you see, it was inserted in because he proposed, he popularized the gap theory. And you know, that had a great influence in his day on Dallas Theological Seminary because they taught the gap theory there. These days, there's a lot more that, that will be teaching millions of years and you know, the Hugh Ross view of progressive creation and so on. In the earlier days, it was more the gap theory. If you look at the Newby Reference Bible, <laughs> what's fascinating about this, uh, the Newby Reference Bible, if you've got one, it doesn't say anything, it just has a gap. <laughs> Do you see that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then there's white space. <laughs> because, again, uh, it was getting across the idea of the gap theory. You might have seen uh, Dake's annotated reference Bible. The anti-chaotic age from the original creation to chaos during, during which time Lucifer ruled earth and perfection before he fell and caused the earth to be made chaotic and flooded. This age took in all the period of the dateless past, the original creations, Lucifer's reign in perfection, the period of rebellion by Lucifer and pre-Adamites, the actual war between heaven and earth, culminating the defeat of Lucifer and his armies as they invaded heaven and the chaotic period on earth after the default of Lucifer's kingdom. These periods were of unknown length and could be called the eternal past. I don't know where he got that from. Ecclesiastes 98 or something. <laughs> but people, you don't, you don't read that in the Bible. We'll talk about some of the ways they try to justify such a thing. First of all, where does the Bible talk about pre-Adamites? 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says, Adam was the first man. There were no pre-Adamites. But first of all, let's look at it from this perspective. Does the Hebrew grammar allow for a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2? Well, for those of you who studied Hebrew, and again, I'm not a Hebrew expert, but I talk to Hebrew experts, and they help me with all of this, and hopefully I'm able to get it right because we talk to people who actually have PhDs in Hebrew, who studied Hebrew, and some of our staff, we have some uh, staff, one who has a master's in theology, and, and a couple, in fact, who have theological qualifications, who have studied considerable Hebrew. But verse 2 begins, and, and. Now, in the NIV, it's translated now. Other translations have various ways of translating this, but and the earth. The and is called a vav. Now, a vav, when it's connected to a verb, like, and God said. It links consecutive events in a sequence. It's called a vav consecutive. And really, vav consecutive, as I understand it, is indicative of historical narrative. And that's how Genesis is written. And God said, and God saw, and so on. So that's typical of historical narrative. That's one of the indicators. It's not poetry, by the way. It's not written like the Psalms. People claim Genesis is poetry. It's ridiculous. 
It's no, the Psalms are poetry, we know that. Now, when the Vav is connected to a non-verb, like verse 2, and the earth, then actually it's not talking about something that's uh, consecutive in a narrative, it really indicates an aside or additional background information. 